We are continuing with Mark chapter 12, and we are going to do verse 35 right to the end, verse 44. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, How is it that the teachers of the law say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your en enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. As he taught, Jesus said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. And so there's a bunch of stuff in there, I'm not going to deal with all of it, but the, the part that talks about Jesus, watch out. For the teachers of the law, they like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplace. They, these, these name people enjoy people's attention. And that is, that is something that bothers me a lot on social networking, Facebook, uh, Twitter. I don't follow a lot of people's blogs just because I don't have a lot of time. There's two or three people that I, I, I read more regularly. And as I see interesting ones, I go and check them out. And, and just recently, the last maybe month or so, there's, there's been some eruptions in Twitter land um, that have really caused me a lot of consternation where I kind of wrote a response blog on it about shining the light. Like, do we spend more time shining the light or do we spend more time attacking the darkness? And one of the consequences of shining the light is that the darkness disappears. And so just seeing a lot of kind of Christian names taking on fights and maybe it's rich coming from me because I am known to, to do some battles at times when I feel it's necessary. But the, the people that I'm following on Twitter, the ones I gravitate towards are the ones that show greater humility. And so there's a couple of people, um, Don Miller is one of them, I really enjoy his stuff and, and he said recently that, that he doesn't take fights onto the internet, he's just learned that it's, it's not a healthy helpful thing for him and I I do think there is a time when we need to challenge people that give public messages that are in error because I think if people have heard it publicly they need to hear it denounced publicly so I'm not saying that should never happen but I'm just talking about the tendencies of people and so there's certain people that that tend towards picking fights and tend towards it becoming a look at me thing and a show thing and certain people who tend to get really disappointed when somebody disagrees with them or oh, I can't believe they did that and then kind of air that publicly on Twitter as if they're trying to get somebody to go, no, no, just fine, you did well. And if you are sharing a truthful message that's going to get negative response, then just hold to it. If it's truth, then let the truth speak for itself. Like Jesus said, people, all men will hate you because of me. And so if, you're not, if everyone's loving your message, chances are that you're probably giving a wrong message. Every good message should have some people that hate it. So click unlike on this video, just otherwise people will think, that this message isn't good. Um, but you know what I'm saying. And the idea of the Pharisees at the time, we see it in some pastors, we see it in a lot of mega churches, unfortunately, where it's all about the pastor. It's about his name. He's the guy that will administer the word of God. And I, I will never lift up a specific church denomination over another one and proclaim this is the way. But definitely one of the things I enjoyed when I was part of the Vineyard Church was that the guy in charge, a guy called John Wimber, like his focus was on the priesthood of all believers. The idea that people in the congregation are going to pray for you. So if you are sick or need of prayer, you don't come to the big man at the front. <clears throat> but you put up your hand and then people around you who are weak and broken and sick will lay hands on you and pray for you and you will be healed. And that's what Hebrews 11 seems to be talking about the priesthood of all believers we've all been made priests now the the curtain in the temple when jesus died it was torn to signify all of us have gained access to the holy of holies we can approach god as abba father our father that is so powerful and we've lost that completely like when you pray the lord's prayer and you are allowed to start a prayer our father 
you take it for granted. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I take it for granted. We do the Lord's Prayer once a week at, at morning prayer. And I try to be reminded that before that, there was a time where Israel had to go through a priest, through a high priest. Once a year, he could go behind the special curtain. They had to go through Moses, who got to meet with God on the mountain. They had to go to the synagogue through the priests. And there was this moment when Jesus came and died on the cross and the curtain was torn. And it's, you can approach my Father in heaven. You have access to God. You have access to me. Let us meet. Let us have intimacy. You can call me Father. You can call me brother. You are no longer my servants because servants do not know the master's business. You are my friends. You are my brothers. There's so much power in that. And it is abused on the other hand where people try to claim that power for themselves, where people autograph books. I know some really great people that autograph books and I just don't understand it completely unless it's something you're forced to do and then your message you're going to direct it to God or direct it to the person or whatever. But, but like this Christian celebrity beast that we've created, it is not what Jesus was about. John the Baptist shows it in John 3 verse 30. He must become greater, I must become less. And sadly, Christian leaders and musicians and worship leaders down the years have not always been continuing that cry. Maybe that is a worship song every worship song writer needs to write. He must become greater, I must become less. Maybe that should be acceptance into worship songwriting school. Until you have a song based on John 3.30, you cannot write worship songs. Until you have a preach based on John 3.30, you are not allowed to preach. That would be amazing. Come on, Bible colleges. Oh, I like that. He must become greater, I must become less. And then the next story is that's kind of demonstrated in a different way where you've got people that are being puffed up. Look how much I'm giving to God. Look at this dollar amount. Look at this rand amount. I am throwing a lot of money into the collection bowl. And then this little widow in front of everyone throws in the two tiniest coins. And you'd expect maybe she'd put it in an envelope and give it to the pastor afterwards or leave it by the door. But publicly in front of everyone, she does something that is, is there to be ridiculed. She's not trying to gain... Any, any kind of fame for giving the smallest offering possible. And a lot of people would have noticed it. And what I just noticed today for the very first time, it says Jesus called his disciples to him. This wasn't a public message. He didn't want to embarrass the woman or anything like that, although it seems to be something that highlights the woman. He calls the disciples to him and he says, you see what she did? That is significant. The rich gave out of their wealth. They gave after tax was taken. Huh? She gave out of what she needed to live on. After her giving her offering, she didn't have enough. What does that say? She trusted God for her needs. Matthew 6.33, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And the, all these things in that passage, food, drink, clothes, your needs. This woman gave out of everything she had. She, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. What are we taking from this example? He must become greater. I must become less. But I can trust God that if I give him everything, if I put myself in a position where I don't have enough, that he is going to come through for me, that he is going to provide my needs. Powerful, powerful stuff. Let us not take this for granted. Our Father, who art in heaven. Goosebumps. That is so powerful.